it's been a lot of fun watching your your journey and the progress and just it's an inspiration honestly because i just i have so many people like all the time they're like how do i how do i niche down to an agent i'm like just go to chris and just study everything he's doing and copy him so i hate that i do that to you but i just there's no better example so i want to yeah so i want to dive into kind of like the origin story of that because i think one thing that i is probably like the biggest struggle probably for people who are starting an agency is like, how do I pick a niche? How do I pick mm -hmm. a niche? And what happens if I pick the wrong niche? What do I do? Right. So like, mm -hmm. how did you get to, how did you get to that point where you're like, this is the niche I'm and I'm, and you, and you had made that conscious decision. Like I'm going all in on this. How did you get to that point? Really good question. It's not asked enough. I think most mentors and coaches talk about the advantages of, of niching, but they don't talk about when enough and the thing for me that I always recommend is you have to have a ton of experiences before you choose a niche. You need to find that Venn diagram, which is the three circles that overlay in the middle of purpose, passion, and profit. Because if you have a purpose and passion area, but you can't make a profit, that's a hobby, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's, it's just not a business. If you can make a profit and maybe you don't have the purpose, maybe it just doesn't get you out of bed when you need to on a Saturday or you have the motivation to continue to give it all. So you got to have these experiences uh, in David Epstein's book, Range. He talks about the example of Nadal, where his parents put him in all these sports and soccer and basketball and, and tennis. And he's the famous tennis player, of course. But imagine if his parents only put him in basketball. They put him in all of these and he, he excelled at tennis. So I think it's, it's wise to have experiences in a lot of different areas and see where, where there is opportunity before you just go all in and choose a niche. Right. So, so for the three agencies that you got your initial experience with, I'm assuming some of them serviced lawyers or possibly personal injury lawyers. That's where you got your kind of foundation. One of them was, they were all three generalist agencies and one of them was heavily weighted in legal. Okay. And to be honest, and just being a little vulnerable here, I've said this before, I picked legal. One of my reasons was not just the opportunity and been around, of course, it was also because there's a little bit of status that came with it. Like I wanted to tell my family and friends like, oh, I'm, I'm doing marketing for attorneys, right? And, and honestly, that's one of the reasons why I chose it. Interesting. So, so how, much, how much did the value of a, uh, uh, how much did client value influence your decision to go into personal injury because obviously the value of a lead in personal injury is mm -hmm. very high versus a hot dog stand. So like did that did that influence your decision or did that just kind of happen subconsciously or was that a conscious decision? Yeah, I I can't remember the exact year, but let's just say 6 years in, I looked at the data and I found that 70% of my revenue was less than 40% of my clientele, which was personal injury. So I knew there was a lot of opportunity and I mean, today you drive into a city, who do you see on the billboards? You see personal injury attorneys. They're everywhere on TV, you turn on daytime television. And I knew that if there was a lot of competition, it would demand expertise. Right. If I was going to focus on, say, trademark law, and there's one trademark attorney in the city, just by the nature of being the only one, they automatically rank and automatically stand out. But PI attorneys, they're, they're everywhere. There's just so many that they need expertise to really stand out in a crowded space. Right. So let, let's go back to when you were first starting. So when you first launched um, your the initial version of your agency, how mm -hmm. many people were working with you? Was it just you? And then you started to add people on? How, how did that How did that look? Yeah, good question. It was me, but I had my affiliate team. Okay. And and they were very well trained. I very processized tons of SOPs before it was even before I even really knew what an SOP or was or process. Like they were trained. And initially, I think I think after the first year, I hired Stephen Willie. He's my president. I got lucky, hired the unicorn out of the gate. Yeah tremendous work ethic. He's my integrator. I mean, who gets lucky their first hire ends up being their, their integrator. And even today I am revenue. So I'm like biz dev side and he is retention. I get the clients, he keeps them. Now I facilitate large relationships and can be involved, you know, because yourself, 
me, Steven, we're all at the top of Bloom's taxonomy on SEO, right? And it's hard to get there where we can kind of synthesize information to come up with a strategy. And so sometimes I do get pulled in when a project gets stuck or we need something out of the box to get it moving. Right. So when you, when you were first starting, how did you get your initial, let's say five to 10 clients? What, how, what, what is the exact process you used? Yeah, I'll, I'll buy the book. This is exactly what I did. The first thing that I did was I tried to contact anyone in the legal space that was local to take them to lunch or lunch or breakfast. Was this in St. Louis or Southern Illinois? In St. Louis. St. Louis. I was okay. living in St. Louis at the time. One of the relationships was one of the top sales reps at Fine Law. Mm -hmm. He was a killer. And I didn't know it at the time, but that relationship served me very well. Not immediately, but over time, just different circumstances of people that he couldn't help. He would refer to me and things that I didn't do, you know, or they needed... Uh, a directory spotter, super lawyers, or whatever, I could refer to him. And I know some of those listening, fine law has value. The directory has value. It's dependent upon the practice area and location. Um, in some locations, it's not, right? It's it's just dependent. You got to analyze it. That was one of the tactics. I, I tried to get belly to belly and, and take people lunch or breakfast and develop a personal relationship. The second thing that I did was I was heavily involved in social media. At the time, it was LinkedIn. And if you look at my LinkedIn recommendations, I, I have more, more than 99% of anyone else. I, I really was involved in that. And then the other thing is I managed a Google Plus circle community. For those of you who, who were on <laughs> Google Plus when it existed for social media, I was a curator for a legal circle. So I, people had to do certain requirements to get in this group and then I would share and then they would get more followers. So I was providing value like that and being transparent, Dolman Law Group, one of my biggest clients, uh, the Levin Firm, still one of my larger clients in Philadelphia. Uh, both of those were acquired on Google Plus. So social media and then the belly to belly stuff. And I also, the third component I was, I'll say is I did a ton of free work. Good. I had no social proof really or testimonials or case studies. And I would just say, Hey, let me, let me show my value. I understand. I don't have this and it's kind of a risk, but let me do all this work for free. And then you can choose to pay me later. And I just did that at the beginning. Wow. A uh, lot to unpack there. So let, let's talk about the, the actual going and shaking hands. Uh, so how, how did you actually, get those appointments or those relationships without having the expertise at the time to do that? I really good question. Honestly, I just asked, right? Yeah. I just said, Hey, I'm starting a digital agency in the legal space. You're very well connected. I would love to take you to lunch. You know, you know, I'll, I'll, t I'll take you out to lunch and I didn't really have a lot to offer, to be honest, Nathan. It's just, I don't know if the circumstances of why the people joined me or, but it, but it worked at the time. And this is just crazy what I'm about to say. LinkedIn for a period of time would allow you to message your entire connection base. Hmm. So I could, I could craft a few messages. Uh, Joey uh, Gilkey calls it spam your TAM, spam your total addressable market. <laughs> I, I would just say, hey, if you're in the St. Louis area and blah, 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 I would love to meet, blah, blah. And then I would get a handful of responses and then kind of coordinate. And I don't think the outbound was as heavy back then as it is today where everybody's hitting your inbox up. And I kind of stood out and I just did it like that. Yeah, I think, I think and you, you know this, like you, we've been in the SEO industry for very long. Like one of the things that many of uh, people in this industry tend to lack is this, uh, there's a fear to go and actually shake hands. There's a fear to actually meet people in person. And like, I know, mm -hmm. you know, based on your experience and my experience, like my close rate, let's say just digitally is 50%. Okay. For a proposal. But when mm -hmm. I go and I shake someone's hand and I have, and I present a proposal there, my close rate's like 95%. I mean, it's, it's just, astronomical the difference so can you explain why it's so important to a develop soft skills 
because obviously that's something you've had to develop over time and you've gotten better at. Uh, and number two, like the importance of trying to actually get face to face with people. Obviously, now in a post COVID world, we can do that again. Uh, so, you know, it's just such a critical thing. So I really want to see if we can kind of unpack that a little bit. Soft skills, incredibly important on in client services and sales. It is understanding their needs or desires from a deeper level. It's hard to develop a lot of, some people have this naturally. We do a couple personality assessments. We do predictive index and we do disc personality assessment to give you an idea. Most of our front facing employees have some component of I. All of our account managers, but one are ID. All of our sales reps are DI. Now, so will you, will you, will you uh, define those just for people who don't understand? Yeah. So D would be like more dominant, like a driver. And I would be like an influencer. And it's just a natural characteristic. And we do personality assessments. Now, here's the deal. I don't make it. It's not a fast fail. If they don't have an IRT. It's just... It's just, I've noticed that people have those traits and it just works. The, the EQ stuff, I think one of the best things that I did, Nathan, was I was a, a server and bartender at a restaurant for three years mm. and people were unhappy or happy. And I just had to deal with a lot of people. And I think that really served me. The other thing I did was there was a stretch for one summer where I worked for AT&T as an outbound call rep and got, I was that guy that everyone hated and cussed out when you answered. And it, I just got a really thick skin for being okay with no. And a, those kind, kind of combined really helped me. On the meeting in person, I think that when you don't so know someone, we're all taught as a kid, like stranger danger, right? In Hermosi's book, stranger danger, right? His hundred dollar leads, leads book that just dropped recently. Versus when you, when you shake hands and you have a genu genuine conversation and you can read their body language and, and have that connection, it's just, it, there's just a certain level of trust. And in fact, in our processes, for retention, because everyone talks about leads, leads, leads. But let me give you an example. You know, Scorpion in our industry retains clients for three years. That's insane. They may charge two thousand dollars a month for SEO, three year commitment. That's seventy two grand, right? Versus if a standard agency charges five grand a month and only retains it for a year, that's sixty. It's significantly more powerful and kind of circling back around. For a certain threshold of clients, we intentionally try to meet them in person after they sign too, because mm. it even helps with the longevity of, the, of a relationship too. Interesting. So you're so that's post sale. You actually have an in person onboarding process as well that you go through. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Very nice. Yeah, I want to I want to dig into that. That that's very cool. Uh, so. So going back to the initial, and the reason why I'm focusing so much on the early stages, because I think it's easy for people to look at where you are now and be like, wow, Chris really built like, but they don't see all of these little iterations, all these little steps that led to mm -hmm. this very, very successful agency. So, um, so obviously going out there and shaking hands. Now, let me ask you this. If you were going to start today and you had no experience, you didn't have your reputation, you didn't have all these good things, would you do the same thing? Ooh. Yeah, I would do that. I would do the things that aren't scalable, the the really um, person to person type activities, the one to one. I may, honestly, obviously not Google I would, Plus, but <laughs> I I would be heavily involved in AI and outbound, and I would be spamming Tam like crazy. I would be doing a lot of of free stuff. I would go to agencies and I would say, Hey, what business are you not accepting? Like, give it to me. I'll monetize it. I'll do the work. Mm. You have a terrible client, send them to me. And I would, I would develop relationships with people that already have pipeline. Those are some of the things that come to mind. The other thing too, 
it's easy for me to say this in retrospect. So I bootstrap my agency. So those are the activities I would do from a bootstrap capacity. But if you said, Nathan, uh, you know, Chris, you have your knowledge now, would I raise capital? 1000% I would raise mm -hmm. capital now because I know which channels work. I know what my CPAs are and where to advertise and, and things like that. But in the beginning, I definitely didn't have that knowledge and I wouldn't have raised capital. Right. So I, in my training, I, I tell people like when they're trying to get their initial pool of clients, like one of the best things to do is either a, like you mentioned, work for free, right? Just, just, you got to bite the bullet, right? You just have to do it to get the portfolio. Cause you, if you don't have a portfolio, you really can't do a whole lot. Like you need results. And so either you have to build your own websites and get those results, or you got to work for free. The other option I say is some sort of front end offer, right? Something very cheap that you could sell to actually, you know, get them to put their credit card out. And now we actually have a customer as opposed to just, you don't want to say a freebie seeker, but obviously with some good qualification, you know, maybe that, that can work. So how did you, like, I think this is a real struggle for a lot of people because there's a lot of, uh, a lot of ego involved, right? In the beginning. Mm -hmm. And so like, how do you, how did you overcome this idea that you had experience? Like you weren't inexperienced, mm -hmm. but you still chose to work for free. Like, how did you, how did you get over that, that particular challenge that a lot of people you know, don't really want to do, right? Oh, it's a waste of time. Is this going to work? You know, all those doubts that come in. So. Really good question. I I read um I'm going to pronounce his name incorrectly, but Robert Cialdini, Cialdini, yeah. his book Influence, one of the uh psychological triggers is reciprocity. I knew that if I did work for free that it, it had the opportunity to come back in some capacity, give value to receive value. So that's that's why I did it. Also, I had I didn't have delivery issues. Like, mm. so, so consider that today it's like, you know, I have to really focus on my time blocks and saying no to opportunities. And, and so I can get into deep work and all these things at the time I didn't have any clients to even rank. So like I could do stuff for free because I had the time once I got that connection. It's definitely different. I also think to just some wording here. I don't like the word free. I like to use the word no charge. I would, I would highly encourage people to use that. Um, it'll serve you better in a lot of circumstances. Uh, anyways, but uh, th that's how I got around it. I'll tell you too, I had one other story. I, I say bootstrap, but I did borrow 15 grand from my sister and just to, just for a little extra capital at the beginning. And I had this guy come to me and he had like 12 websites back in the day when it was the EMD website for everything. And he's like, I want you to do a deep analysis on all these. And he wanted to pay me a thousand dollars a site. And I'm like, let's do it. And I, and it was like, like three or four of, those, uh, of the worst days of my life, <laughs> like having to do that. Cause it was just so involved, but I did it and I, I, that within the first six months I paid my sister back. So it's just taking some projects like that and, and doing the things that, that, that aren't easily scalable. But doing the things that a lot of people won't do as well. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, I think knowing you for now, as long as I have, like, you seem to have a tendency to do a lot of things that a lot of people wouldn't. Like I, I always use the example, which you've told me before, is like you've sent gift baskets to prospects. Like mm -hmm. when, when you told me that, I was like, that is so out of this world because so little people would ever do that because I think a lot of people view these, these actions as it's all loss right? I'm losing. I'm not like, I'm going to lose money on that. I'm not going to make money for that. But the way you see it is no, I'm, I'm investing in that relationship and I'm adding value to stand out, which then could lead to business in the future. So can you, is that something you've had naturally or is that something you had to develop? Cause it's a very interesting skill. Definitely had to develop it. One of the biggest things that anyone listening can do to help their agency is to consider always leading with value on everything. You send a proposal out, don't say just following up. 
What do you notice that can provide value to them? That's how you follow up. Hey, go change this. Your, your Google business profile category is attorney. Change it to personal injury attorney. That's a quick win. It'll only take you five minutes. That'll really help you out. The other thing too, we talk about no-shows, right? No-shows, especially when you're doing cold outbound and you want to avoid no-shows. Well, what do you do? Yes, you can do Calendly reminders with texts or emails and those types of things. But you want to go the extra mile? Go to their website a couple days before the meeting. Find something, an easy win. A broken link, their homepage title tag says home, their GBP, whatever it is. Say, hey, I know we have our meeting in a couple days, but I just saw this and I wanted to let you know about this. And this is just a quick win. So what does that do? The first thing it does is it makes them, it tells them you are thinking about them, even though their meeting's not for two days. The second thing is you're providing value. You're creating this value currency and all this reciprocity buildup before they even attend the meeting. They already owe you. So the likelihood that they're going to drop off, this is very low. And, and yes, does that take more work? Does that take managing your calendar? Absolutely. But it's immensely more valuable and, and I, it definitely impacts your win rates. So are you always trying to brainstorm and strategize how you can give more value to, to increase that relationship even further? Like you're always looking for those little areas, little leverage points to just continually stack on the value. Thousand percent. It is what 99 people out of 100 get wrong. Most people think they need to go cheaper. And that is the, that's a race to the bottom. You're cutting your margins. You're competing with everyone because that's what everyone thinks. The different mindset is, how can I create more value, thus increase my prices? Hmm. How can I create more value to where they're willing to pay for that value? And that's why, you know, people in the SEO space, you got all these content companies that are just spooking, right? And they're just going under, right? You got these outsourced content agencies. Why? They're all racing to the bottom, trying to get cheaper and cheaper content with AI. Instead, hey, Google's looking for expertise. How about you source some experts, do some original data, um, do some surveys, um, things that the AI wants to feed off of. Nobody's doing that. Why? It's harder. Right. But that's where value is. That's where margin and opportunity is. Right. Yeah. So tell me, yeah, because pricing is a big piece of this. And obviously you demand premium prices for your services. That's by design, of course, because I'm assuming mm -hmm. you came to the conclusion that higher prices attract better clients. Uh, so prior to that point, though, what did your pricing model look like and how has that kind of evolved over time to where you are now? Good question. Back in the day, I was cost plus. It was either selling hours or selling units. Okay. And, and trading time for money. And now it's, it's a combination. It's not pure value. It still is some of that um, unit based. Uh, where I, I particularly put it in content. I use it as part of my value prop. I say, hey, we create more content in the first month than most agencies do in the first year. And I really push the speed component. There's other little components to it, um, LSA and Google ads and things like that to generate cases in the initial first months instead of waiting you know, six months that everybody says, even though we know, both know that it doesn't always take that long. Right. The, so yeah, it's, you know, when you charge higher fees, you have more money, you have more, uh, the ability to create more value too. If, if they're just paying you a thousand dollars a month, what can you do? You, you, got to get really crazy with some AI or, or some international arbitrage. It's, there's just not a lot of money for you to do cool things. Yeah. So was there, was there a certain kind of like pivot point for when you came to the conclusion that pricing needed to go up and then you probably saw, I'm assuming you saw an explosion in business growth. Cause I, that, that's what happened for me. Like I, mm -hmm. I, you know, I charged, this is embarrassing to say, by the way, but at one point when I first started my first ever client, I got him from Craigslist, similar to what you were doing. Um, I charged a hundred dollars a month. A that's how, that's how my comp, that's where my confidence was, you know, was at the mm -hmm. time, like a hundred bucks a month was all I could stomach. And even then when I even pitched that, I was like, Ooh, I don't know if I can do this. Right. And yep. like, 
and so a lot has changed since then. And so I think it's a very uh, strange thing that happens when you when you increase your price and then you realize like what have I been doing this whole time? Because everything changes. Like uh, you get better clients. You actually, what I found is I actually close deals better too. It's a very weird thing because it's it's the perception of value, right? Your perceived value increases dramatically just because of the price alone. Um, and I, you've probably heard this study before where like, you know, they tested all these different jams and it was all the same jam, but they just changed the price and, and people just naturally started buying the more expensive one just because it seemed higher quality, right? So... So just, I think it's like, this is a very important point. Cause I'm always trying to tell people like, if there's anything to do today, just increase your price. Like, just please do it. So how did you, how did you get over that hurdle to be like, no, we're just going to consistently increase prices. And I think you also, um, you increase prices on existing clients as well. Correct. So, um, yeah. Mm-hmm. So I'd like to hear about both of those. Yeah. So your, your pricing has to be commensurate with the value they receive. Once I understood what an average case cost would be for a client and how much it was worth, it changed the game. Mm. Once I once I started asking how many cases on average you get per month, what's an average case worth, then you can calculate and, and put put metrics out there. That's that's one of the issues. And I, and I I saw a competitor proposal today. And their pricing, I looked at what they're receiving. I was like, there's no way they can maintain this. They're going to churn this client, you know, very quickly because there's just not enough value in the offer. Mm -hmm. It was a big offer, right? I'm sure they get really good margins for four or five months. And they're like, oh, what happened? It's like, well, you know, you you, you have to actually create a lot of value too. So that, those are a, a few things. How did I do it? I, with the more competent we are, the, the more confident we are. And when I just started landing deals and when I was performing really well and ranking these clients, I got more competent to increase my prices. And once I understood the market, that's one of the advantages of niching. You understand the value that you deliver. Uh, I read several books. Alan Weiss has a, a few books, Value-Based Pricing, uh, Million Dollar Consultants. Uh, Blair Inns has a book called Pricing Creativity. Uh, you know, Alex Ramosi's $100 million offers is a pretty good one. There's, you know, a ton of these types of books and just kind of put it all together and started throwing some big numbers out there and started landing them. Yeah. It's, so it's always surprising too, when you land it for the first time, like you're mm-hmm. like, oh, wait, they actually yeah. said yes. <laughs> it's mm-hmm. always so weird. Yeah. It's, here's the other deal too, Nathan, and you, you've mentioned it, right? The jam thing. So right now I'm in Marion, Illinois and nearby tons of fast food restaurants all charging five dollars for a happy meal right the bundled pricing right right versus there's a couple high-end steak joints i wouldn't i mean not really high end compared to like you know clayton or st louis but a couple steak joints versus tons of these fast food restaurants like this steak joint has better quality of food a better experience it's higher price yet it has less competition than the fast food restaurant. Right. You can get a steak, you go to this one or that one. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, even it's, it's funny because at this point, I'm not, maybe I'm sure some of your competitors are going to be watching this, but (laughs) it's an important point to make just for everyone who's trying to start an agency. Like everyone knows that you have a business model that works. Everyone knows that you have an agency model that works yet. Do you really have that many competitors? I mean, like in the grand scheme of things, maybe on two hands, like of real genuine competitors, maybe one hand, like of guys you're like, I got to watch that guy like that. But that's about it. Like one hand. So it just shows that even when there's like, it's clear as day that people could copy you and do exactly what works. People still choose to go broad, to be the big agency. And so- Mm -hmm. How how can you explain to someone the benefit of niching down versus I'm going to be what's our friend Rob Timmerman for example okay mm-hmm. <laughs> Rob's the, Rob's in a unique position right because he's been doing it uh-huh. so long he can do what he does but mm-hmm. if you were telling someone to start you probably wouldn't tell him to do what Rob does it's probably not like a good starting place to begin so like 
how how can you kind of explain the the value of those two different approaches like going broad and try to you know cast a wide net versus no let's narrow this in and and focus on lawyers or plumbers or hvac or whatever it may be really good question okay there's a lot to this and and rob t i love the shout out he's got a great agency uh we are tg he really does a good job on seo segments those landing pages and, and absolutely the epitome of doing it right from a, you know a multi-industry perspective there's a, there's just a lot to this so uh, i'm just going to say multiple things that come to mind the first thing is we have a business to create profit so not enough people are talk about that but that's why we have a business is to create profit the first thing that you do when you niche is it allows you to maximize your capital allocation for targeting. So you know where to market. You're, you're directly going after individuals in a sector, right? You got clutch, clutch directory, there's a legal directory. You got Google ads, you're doing, you're capturing existing demand for bidding on law firm SEO services. You know where they congregate for events. You know where they congregate in social media. So it gives you a target. The second thing that it does is it creates efficiencies for profitability. Instead of creating an editorial calendar for and doing keyword research for tons of agencies, I'm creating it for one, right? I'm understanding how to optimize title tags and meta descriptions, all these things for one. It's not a, a blank canvas every time where you lose a lot of margin. There... Malcolm Gladwell has this saying about you need 10,000 hours on a particular discipline to become an expert. Well, if you're doing this across all agencies and all industries, sorry, it's going to take a long time for you to truly become an expert. The other thing is capital allocation. One of the main reasons why generalist agencies fail is because they don't have enough capital to segment and target each industry. Knowing what I know now, I could definitely go after plumbing and, dent and dental and all these different industries because I know how to properly allocate capital, create my processes and, and productization for those. And I know the questions to ask to, to understand value. But if you don't have the capital, you, you need to deploy it in the best manner possible. There are other components, relationship capital, relationship equity. Everyone talks about when people think of, uh, you know, dividends or, or compounding, you always think of finance, right? But there's also something to be said with relationship capital and, and compounding your, your experience there. Like if, if I'm going into legal and these other markets, like I'm not going to talk to John Morgan or Mike Papantonio out of the gate. I got to talk to this firm, then this firm, you go up the ladder and go up the ladder and then you meet someone that knows John, you do good work and you keep going bigger and bigger. You don't just stop generally, start generally at the top of the ladder. There's some exceptions. Uh, the, the Arnold Schwarzenegger deck documentary was a good exception for that, where he just went right to the top of the ladder and all these, <laughs> but in general, you got to move up the ladder and, and kind of grind your way to the top. And I think that's where niching just really helps in all those areas it's it's very challenging to to compete the other thing too is is winning the deal it's if if you're a generalist agency there's gonna be a niche agency in a in a market that, where there's opportunity you know, ch chiropractors dental somebody has a niche agency so you're going up against them so you better have a track record of, of experience. You better have a good sales process and case studies in order to win that deal. So those are just some of the reasons why I, I think it's advantageous to start a niche. I think it's very advantageous from about zero to 10 million. Um, there's, some, there's exceptions. After you get to eight figures, you start to have a little bit more capital deploy. You can start to widen your TAM or expand your service offerings, but you, you will start to slow. It, it depends on your niche, but I, I would suggest expanding later. Yeah. And I mean, I know you guys recently have expanded a little bit outside of personal injury, but how long mm -hmm. were you just personal injury? How, many, how long did you just focus on that? At least three years, maybe four, okay. just personal injury. Still... I think we have, let's just say we have 76 clients and 70 of them are PI. 
Okay. So the the reason why I expanded, truthfully, is because we've got a PI attorney in most of the major markets. Uh, exclusivity, we can talk about that conversation next if you want or or later. The the second reason is, is I was turning down a ton of non-PI mm. and just fast failing them, just sending them out. So I already had pipeline there. And there's just a lot of waste. For example, cl- let's just talk about the directories, right? Because they can be an avenue for leads, you know, up city, clutch, things like that. They don't have a personal injury directory. They have a legal directory. When you're doing Google ads, it's very challenging to do just personal injury SEO, personal injury marketing, because a personal injury attorney could type in law firm marketing or law firm SEO. Right. And there's just a lot of those scenarios. And that that's some of the reasons why we decided to expand a little bit. Okay. Yeah. So the the reason I'm asking is because going back to the the TAM total addressable market, like I think one thing that people get hung up on is the fear that there's not enough opportunity when you niche down. And like, Mm -hmm. I think people really underestimate how much opportunity there is in really small pockets. And like Mm -hmm. the fact that you've done personal injury and talking about exclusivity, like, so you do two per city or one per city? We don't do any anymore. Okay. Uh, We we have a couple grandfathered in and I've had, I've, I've had some direct conversations with clients recently And, and here it's, it's very simple. When you're a small agency and you're just giving up exclusivity for two thousand a month or four thousand a month, it's no big deal because you don't have any clients. But it is a big deal later because of opportunity cost loss, and 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 people really take the high horse stance here. But the number one reason why you shouldn't offer exclusivity is because you should never restrict your client's ability to grow. If you're doing good work, and I hope you're doing good work, and you have a client in St. Louis, and for whatever reason, they want to open an office in Chicago, you should let them and you should help them market it. Because if they want to open an office in Chicago, and you can't do their SEO, they're going to go use someone else or they're going to bring it in-house. So we never restrict our client's ability to grow. Mm -hmm. Now, ethically, we don't have an exact uh, number. It's how can we ethically generate an ROI? Can we generate an ROI for two people or three or four? Maybe they target different subsets of practice areas. Then absolutely. Be a good person. Have integrity, right? Don't sell a contract you know that's not going to work, right? It's, it's just be good. You know, when you, the other thing people don't talk about, Nathan, is when you choose a niche, you're choosing to have integrity. Because when you come to that little party and you're in that community, and you've done someone dirty, the whole party knows about it. So you yeah. better be above board on the reputation side. And um, anyways, that's my, that's my whole thing on exclusivity. You can't really even do it with SEO anyways. Let's be real, guys. The map pack proximity, you're three miles away. You don't rank the, 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 the ranking differences. You, know, the, you can have some exceptions and prominence, but it's really hard to properly do it. There, there are certain avenues that you hear it for radio or TV that own distribution. That's not the case for SEO. So I'm, I've really turned a corner. I think for those listening that, that maybe, oh, you know, using it as a value prop, I think it's a huge mistake. Yeah. So, so let's talk about the most obvious question here. Okay. <laughs> Which is from the, I, didn't, I didn't say we we're going to get too deep into SEO. But let's talk a little SEO yeah. from this perspective. Okay. From the perspective yeah. of exclusivity. Okay, let's say mm-hmm. scenario wise, let's just say you close three personal injury lawyers in St. Louis. Mm-hmm. Who wins? All three of them, if they're working with us. I mean, um, <laughs> good answer. <laughs> <laughs> you know, three personal injury lawyers. Do they are they all auto accident attorneys? You know, yeah, are they? All, yeah, do, yeah. They're, are they all? So here, here's the deal. Like, if you got a a downtown, you got a Brown and Crouppen. Right versus a page law or a brown and brown, you know, those are five, 10 miles away. You got one, you know, up near Clayton area. Um, they don't rank in the map pack. There's some overlay, but they have the, all three have the ability to succeed. And I would say that probably there might be a circumstance where I'd only take two, but there might be a scenario where I'd take three. 
but this goes back to your the ethical discussion because yeah. the inte- and the integrity because you're not going to take on five. That's no. kind of the point, right? Like you're it's yeah, it may not be hard coded in your policy that you only take on two, but ethically, just as your general company culture, like we're just not going to take on a fifth personal injury lawyer in St. Louis who wants to rank yeah. for St. Louis personal injury lawyer. Like it just doesn't yeah. make sense. Yeah, so. you look at you look at you know, take Houston. Huge demographic, you know, huge geographic area. You got a client, you could have a client downtown, the Northwest, the Northeast, same for Atlanta, right. these huge, huge markets. I mean, you can absolutely generate an ROI and be ethical about serving more than one client in, in a market like that. Other areas, um, you know, Rhode Island, you know, and, and places like that, maybe, maybe you just take one and, and that's okay. It's, it just depends. And so that's why we don't have all, we kind of just choose like, and we have those transparent com- conversations, right? And yeah, yeah. Well, we're getting getting close on time, so I want to fire a couple more important questions. Which is, we got to talk about the sales process. <laughs> I think that is right. the most important thing. So, um, and obviously, I know you you've done mm-hmm. an extensive amount of testing. I know at one point you were doing a front end offer, and then then at one point you pulled the front end offer. So I know you're always testing. So. Mm-hmm. Um, how has that evolved over time? Kind of take, kind of walk me through like the moment. Actually, let's go even prior to them getting into the sales process. Let's talk about um, how they became a sales qualified lead. How did they get to that point? And then go into the deep the process. I'd love to hear that. Well, we didn't start doing outbound until heavily until this year. So they've always been inbound. Most of them are sales qualified leads. Um, there's a different definition. Like if they want marketing services and they're an attorney, like they're a sales qualified lead. They, they have, so you don't, you don't have budget. to develop, you don't have to develop them very far to get to that point. No, it's not like they're no. marketing qualified lead and they got to run through a nurture sequence to get them. These are mainly like they're searching they're for services. Leads. They're, yeah. they're in. Okay. Yeah. We've changed this a lot. We, we've sold an audit. We quit selling an audit because everybody else gives them for free. And we didn't want to try to sell a person twice. There, I, I love the foot in the door and acquiring a customer at a low ticket price, showing value, and then selling them later. I love that. Personally, I haven't found the right foot in the door offer to do that. We do a two call close. We do a qualification call where we get the details. How many cases you get in per month? What's an average case worth? Where are you getting the majority of your clients from? What geographic areas do you want to target? What practice areas do you want to target? Are you working with an agency? You know, how quickly do we need to um, get started? You know, uh, are there anything that would stop us from working together? Like I I have a list um, that I have and I'm not in the sales game anymore, really. But um, we ask those. And then what we do, and this is the key distinction for we used to, then do an analysis and kick the next call out a week or two. We don't do that anymore. We'll say, hey, is later today or tomorrow uh, okay, or is that too soon? Because when they're ready to buy, and our prospects are generally DI, they're impatient, they don't want to wait around. By the way, also when you kick a project out for a week or two week, two weeks, what do they have the opportunity to do? They have the opportunity to go talk to other people. Right. I don't want them to talk to other people. So we try to talk to them that same day, a second time, or the next day. And in between that, I do a competitive analysis. We use a lot of tech here to kick one out pretty quick. Very, very pretty. And that's what we do. We do a two-call close. The first meeting, we get them on the calendar for the second meeting. We don't leave without them on the calendar. And in that meeting, it's a two-call close. We, we answer their objections. We have this little, you know, we talk about uh, their investment and everything we're going to do. But that's what we do. Pretty simple. Our sales cycle is a lot shorter once we started kicking these, uh, shortening when the second call occurred. And it works. So you, so you, did you have a nice conversion lift when you short, when you con- condense that sales cycle, you saw a nice conversion difference? Conver- our, our win rates, uh, our through line win rate, which means from lead received to win, and our proposal presented increased uh, that win rate. The other thing is our sales cycle short- shortens, so that's a velocity of receiving cash for capital allocation. So just um, three reasons to do it. I 
The other thing I noticed, we used to do, Nathan, we used to do these beautiful Google Data Studio, bring in the ARS or SEMrush a, uh, API and have them visually appealing with the client's brand. And, <laughs> and I would have these DI individuals on the call, just their eyes were just, they're just bored. They didn't care. Like they knew no. they had these issues. They, they just want someone to help them. And once I started realizing that, I'm like, okay, let's get down. Here's the 80-20. Here's the big issues here. You've got 100 referring domains. Your competitors all have 600 minimum. You have 25 reviews. All your competitors have 300. You, you know, like, it's just cut and dry. And yeah. those are the big impact things versus, oh, you got a health auto score of a 74. Like, who gives a shit? Yeah, go optimize your titles and meta. You know, there's, it's... They need to know the big impactful things. Right. Yeah. Oh man, I'm so happy you said that because that's like the biggest shift I made in my proposals. Like I used to do the same thing. These epic monstrosity dissertations of proposals of everything that's ever been wrong about their business and their campaign. Mm -hmm. Then one day I was like, what am I doing? I'm just going to, I'm just going to make this so stupidly simple. So I changed my proposal and it, it's exactly what you described. It's like, Hey, this is who I am. This is what we do. Here are five action items that we can go and attack right now. Get right into those. And then here, basically, like you mentioned, the gaps, like just math, like here's the math, mm -hmm. like they, your client, you know, your, your competitors have a thousand referring domains. You have two. So this is going to take a little bit yeah. of time to get going here. Um, and then here's the investment, three options. So, uh, and like my close rate skyrocketed. My presentations got cut in half. Like I'm closing deals, mm -hmm. you know, in 20 minutes, as opposed to an hour presentation where everyone's eyes are glossed over and no one cares. Yeah. And so as you scale, as you, as you or, or myself scale, let's say a, an AE, a, a closer has a capacity of five consults a day. So you got five days, you got 25 for four weeks, you got a hundred consults a week. If they were an hour, you, maybe you could only do 50. So their capacity increases. The There's just so much there and it, it's just changed the game. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so when you get, so when you get an, in, uh, most, most of your leads are inbound, correct? Uh, 75, 80% now. Okay. Yeah. I know you do a little bit of outbound, but mostly inbound. So yeah. coming from, from ads, referrals, organic, roughly. Yeah, organic ads, directories, uh, account referrals as a uh, as an inbound. Um, standard What's your stuff, best? Our podcast. Oh, your podcast. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. our podcast because so, we good distribution there. Okay, so why don't you let's say your top five channels, rank them in order of driving the best leads. The best leads for quality. The, the, yeah, podcast quality. number one. SEO number two. Uh, we have uh, an event team that we don't set up boosts, but we go there strategically. I'd say number three. Number four would be Google Ads. Five, social or the directories, and it kind of gets off of Water that. Watered down from there. Off. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but is what about referrals? Referrals. Is number one. Okay. referrals I was going to say, I was going to say yeah. referrals is probably number one. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Love those commission only sales reps. Anybody want to, to make some money? Just talk to me. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. So you get the leads in, uh, they go through a form. You don't have a, they can't actually call a phone number. Can they, you don't do. Phone no, leads. we need. Yeah. Uh, at some point I want to set her and to do the qualification to answer the phone. But, but we just use Calendly. We, we like it because it has those, those automatic, we do, a reminder the day before, an hour before, and we do a text 15 minutes before. Also, just want to circle back really quick to one thing you said. You present the three options. I think this is critical. A lot of times people will present just one option. And if you, if you present just one, then they don't know how that compares to something else, right? When you take a picture, a lot of times you put your hand next to the item so you can see how big it is, right? right? So if you present three, you can see the range of value. And you can see that, hey, maybe the 5K that they thought was expensive. Oh, that's your lowest offer. And they can see where they, they can see where the next level is up at the pinnacle. Um, but that's, that's just a really important one too. Yeah. And I, I, I found that because when I first started, I was like, it's going to be 500 bucks a month. And then, mm -hmm. I, and then I started to get deeper into business and come to find out, obviously, 
you know, tiered pricing, which I really kind of stole from SaaS, right? SaaS has got this mastered ultimately, but yeah. that big, that big premium package. Yeah. Very tiny percentage will take it, but it's really to function as an anchor. So, yes. um, yeah, so it's or a decoy. It, yeah, or or that. So, it, but it has so much utility, um, and to not have it is like you're just doing yourself a massive disservice. So, um, so yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because that was a huge shift I had where I was like, oh, okay, now. And it's funny, like everyone I talk to who I tell, okay, use a three tier pricing, their revenue doubles because what happens is most people, it's a weird thing that happens. People don't like picking the cheapest package. It's a weird, like, I don't know if it's a psych, you know, I don't know the, the, the psychology behind that. Maybe it's a, uh, some sort of ego based reason. Like, oh, I don't want to seem cheap. So, mm -hmm. but I, man, I've just seen so consistently that middle package just gets picked over and over. And so when you've increased your prices, you get the value of that. Um, mm -hmm. so yeah, I think it, I think it's a great point. So yeah, very interesting on your, your sales process. Now, um, you get them on the discovery call, uh, the discovery calls. How, how long are those usually just maybe 20, 30 minutes? Maybe. Uh, yeah, I think they book for 30, but generally it's like 15, 20 minutes. Okay. And then hopefully if it go, if it's a good fit, you're going to try to get them on a call tomorrow. Yeah. 45 minutes okay. is what we said on that one. Okay. We'll 15 minute buffers. The other thing too, is we allow people to book within two hours of our, of hitting the contact form as opposed to the next day. Okay. We want them when they're, when they're hot. I mean, honestly, I would like them to book immediately, but giving my AEs a little bit of comfort there. Um, yeah. yeah. So on, on the, uh, on the proposals, are you, are, are you using like decks or are you using PDFs? What, what, what kind of proposal framework are you using there? So on the, um, on the proposals, we do a, Notion. We do Notion proposals. So we oh, use Notion for our knowledge base. And you can you can send a link to share and you can expire the link, which mm -hmm. I really like that feature. So it contains them a little bit better. And you can embed videos, you can embed images, and it also makes our our uh when we're onboarding a client easier because we can just pull them into the client area. So it's still in the same location as opposed to you know bringing in a PowerPoint or something to different areas. Um, right. So we use Notion. I think they look really good. The, you know, when we do the contract, we do an MSA SOW. So we'll do a master service agreement and then we just append a SOW. Right. Okay. Yeah. And no, oh, I have two very important questions for you. Uh, do you send the proposal before the call? No. Okay. Don't do that, guys. Just wanted to make. I just wanted to make sure. Okay. Yeah. Because that's that's a mistake I see a lot of people make. They they shoot off that proposal before the call's even booked. By the way, they'll send the proposal off. Okay. Now will you book the call? And we know what happens there. Yeah. Scroll to the pricing. Boom. You don't get any chance to demonstrate value. You know, give results mm -hmm. in advance or anything. You just lose automatically. So yeah, I think it'd be good for people of your caliber to hear that. Like you don't do that. <laughs> Yeah, don't don't do that. You want to you want to present in person, answer their objections, uh, you know, reinforce the value they're going to receive and, and and definitely present in person. Right. Yeah. And then the other thing I was going to ask you is the last question, which is on, actually an SEO question, because it's a mm -hmm. there's a lot of people who have personal injury lawyers and as clients and they run into the same issue where they're trying to create content like top of the funnel content not not the not the you know the lead generation pages more like what is personal injury right so how do they deal with this challenge of like they have three personal injury lawyer clients and they need to create national based content to fill some sort of topic authority gap which i don't personally recommend but people tend to mm -hmm. do it uh how do you deal with that without like how do you create uniqueness among those topics for really the same thing that's a challenge. We, we start bottom of the funnel up. And so we, we really hit those practice area pages hard, particularly their Google business profile page, which is the most important page. A lot of people mm -hmm. undervalue that and, and align that with just other practice pages. So we we'll, we'll really hit that one hard. We call it a paramount, pa paramount page. Um, it's the most important page. The, you know, 
it's shifted, right? We used to do a lot more of the top and middle funnel, you know, those questions or awareness pieces. Right. And unless we can really create something's unique, we we don't do those as often. I think a lot of that's going to be eaten up with eaten up with AI. For sure. Um, so we're doing we're really focusing on those service pages, refreshing them, showing our expertise. Um, yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Chris. This has been amazing. I think it's going to be very, very valuable for <laughs> a lot of people who are starting out or even trying to scale to your level. Um, hopefully, I didn't create too much competition for you. Uh, oh, but, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I love it. Competition makes you better. Yeah, competition exactly. makes you better. So how, how can people find you? How can they follow you? Yeah, you guys can uh, add me on LinkedIn. Just search for Chris Dreyer. Dreyer's D-R-E-Y-E-R. If you know, drop me an email, you can shoot me an email at chris at rankings.io. Please don't spam me saying you're going to book me full of leads or uh, sell me backlinks. <laughs> but if you have something genuine of interest, uh, shoot me an email, chris at rankings.io. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much, Chris. Appreciate it so much. And we'll talk soon. Thanks for having me, Nathan.